When a company gets big enough, there is so much data to be processed that an entire data engineering team becomes responsible for managing this data and making it available to other teams. Airbnb is in exactly this situation with so much data that it needs a data engineering team. Maxime Bilchemin works on the data engineering team at Airbnb, where he creates infrastructure and tooling for managing data. In this episode of Software Engineering Daily, we talk about Airflow, a workflow scheduler that assists in job processing. If you don't know what a workflow is or a job, we will explain that in this episode. Max and I also talk about Panoramics, a data slicing and data visualization tool that helps data scientists and business analysts understand large volumes of data. Data engineering at Airbnb on this episode of Software Engineering Daily, as soon as we get back from a message from one of our sponsors. Engineers love automation, and Wealthfront automates your investing. As a software engineer, there are certain processes that you want to execute no matter what, like integration tests during a build. You wouldn't execute integration tests manually. You would use a continuous integration tool like CodeShip or Jenkins to automate your integration tests. Wealthfront is a tool to automate investing. Just like a continuous integration tool runs your tests automatically, Wealthfront can reinvest your dividends automatically and perform tax loss harvesting automatically. To get your first $15,000 managed by Wealthfront for free, go to Wealthfront.com slash SE Daily and get started with Wealthfront's layer of automation on top of your portfolio. Wealthfront.com slash SE Daily. Check it out. It would support Software Engineering Daily, and you will get $15,000 managed for free if you sign up. Automate your investing. Get back to the things that you can't automate, like writing code. Max Bushman is a data engineer at Airbnb, helping to develop and scale the company's data warehouse. Max, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Definitely. In January 2016, which is when we're recording this podcast, what does it mean to be a data engineer? Oh, wow. So I think data engineer is kind of a new role. I feel like... um, you know, things have changed in the business intelligence or analytics world over the past five years or so. And I've, I've been kind of the forefront of seeing some of, of that transformation. So I think not only the field is changing, but uh, the definition of the roles are, are changing quite a bit. Uh, data engineers maybe used to be called uh, business intelligence engineers, and maybe there was less programming involved. So I think like uh, a data engineer is uh, much more of a software engineer than traditionally, you know, data people used to be. So, the, so, so that's a, a transformation we've been seeing, yeah, over the past uh, five to ten years. You've been using Hadoop since you worked at Yahoo back in 2007. What has changed the most about the Hadoop stack in that period of time? Wow. So the the thing at Yahoo in 2007, it was really hard to foresee that Hadoop was actually going to become something from what I was seeing at the time. Uh, not much of it was actually working. Uh, it was really hard to get anything done on that platform. We would wait for uh, 24 hours for our processes to make it through the queue. And then it would just fail with cryptic error messages. Uh, so the fact that it's usable um, is probably the main difference. Uh, but, but I think the ecosystem has, has changed quite a bit. And uh, one big transformation we're seeing right now is kind of the, the death of MapReduce or the slow, de- slow agonizing death of MapReduce. Um, it's, it's probably going to be you know, there for years to come. Uh, but, but now um, you know, we just see too much um, wasted IEO and wasted cycles with my produce and people are moving to things like Spark. Hmm. So as you mentioned, the occupation of data engineer didn't even really exist by name 10 years ago. And the responsibilities of that role were wrapped up in the job of a data scientist or a software engineer up until very recently. But even today, it seems like that the expectations of a data engineer are expanding. Is is the job of a data engineer going to splinter and specialize even more in the future? 
Um, it's yeah, it's unclear to me exactly how it's going to evolve, but I, I kind of did a bad job on your earlier question as to what a da- what a data engineer does, and I'd like to uh, kind of go to the core of, of that a little bit. So, a data engineer um, is a per- person, at least you know uh, the definition that we have we had at Facebook when I was there, and the definition we have here at Airbnb is closer to a person that's in charge of organizing, summarizing, uh, cleaning. Uh, the, da- the the company's data, often in a data warehouse, and in many cases that includes, um, you know, managing the data pipelines and making sure so owning the data structures, the quality of the data itself, as well as uh, the pipelines that deliver this data. Um, so th- there's definitely a, a move towards also like supporting batch processes from, you know, uh, supporting batch processes to more streaming and, um, you know, having having uh, real time or close to real time data as well. Yeah, let's let's characterize that uh, more specifically. Like you work at Airbnb. What are some characteristics of Airbnb's data engineering requirements? And and also, how are you handling that shift from batch to streaming? Right, so we're in, we're in the middle of kind of uh, defining what our, our streaming uh, infrastructure is going to look like, and uh, we're building a lot of very exciting stuff uh, at this at this moment. Um, so, so how the role is transforming? Um, so this this transition, I think a lot of people are going through it, and I think a lot of people are starting to go um, uh, through a lambda architecture, so having some element of the data. Uh, streaming in real time and and having some some batch processes and using you know the the, the two kind of endpoints to be able to to double to cross check data and to to not necessarily fail over but to be able to uh, reconstruct you know a, a version of the truth. Uh, so the role is changing very much be, because of that. Be, uh, the tool set and the stack is very different on the batch processing side as it is on, on the streaming side. And uh, that that brings a whole new set of platforms and, and languages, um, and a new set of challenges. Hmm. Well, let's talk more about those. Like, what are the what are the tools that you see as key uh, in in this shift? What are like what are the ones that you see as uh, as common among all of the all of the types of architectures that are moving from from a mostly batch to a more streaming based architecture? Right, so I can, I can talk a little bit as to the stack that we use at Airbnb um, as far as as uh, batch processing goes, and as far as where we're going towards uh, streaming, and then I can try to relate that more on the industry scale and see what else is at is at play or That'd be great. is moving yeah. right now. So, um, so as far as batch processing goes at Airbnb, so we use the Hadoop platform heavily, you know, and we use High very heavily too. So that means a data engineer at Airbnb. Um, authors a fair amount of HQL, which is the Hive query language, very similar to uh, to SQL. Um, note that HQL translates or compiles into MapReduce. So behind the scene, we have when you write a Hive query or Hive you know pipeline uh, behind the scene that compiles into MapReduce. It's very ex- it's extremely stable, very flexible, um, mostly like easy to read, easy to maintain, easy to author. And Airflow is kind of the glue by which we orchestrate all of our HQL and other scripts. Um, so batch processing stack would be Hadoop, Hive, other people use Pig, and something to glue all these components together, plus you know one or many scripting languages to, um, to, get, to get things done in general. Now on the streaming side, uh, so Kafka seems to be very popular and we use that extensively. Um, you need some sort of good serialization framework or language. So people use Avro or Thrift. Um, so here we're going with Thrift. Uh, so we're doing some, you know, it starts from the very beginning. It would be having a good logging framework, you know, that can um, generate events that will go on one side, you know, or that will go to Kafka and then they can, you know, split into your um, your Lambda architecture and go on one way batch process to Hadoop. And on the other side, um, go towards something uh, like Spark streaming or something where you can do stream processing. So in our case, we're building um, some automation or some framework 
uh, that's config driven on top of Spark streaming. Other people use uh, Senza, I believe. So that's kind of an industry standard as well. Um, and then uh, you need some sort of database that can uh, get data in real time. So in our case, we decided to go with Druid.io, uh, which is like a really interesting database that's an open source project out of a company called MetaMarket and extensively used at Yahoo. So um, and a bunch of places. So it's a it's an open source project with a lot of traction. So yeah, we did a show about Druid. It's super interesting. Yeah. So it's uh, and it fits very well into. Um, you know, the kind of architecture that most companies have. And it, it can really play that role of um, slice and dice all app analysis on the real-time side. And it plays well with the Lambda architecture, too. It's possible with Druid to get data from your Hadoop cluster to overwrite on, on your Druid data sets. That makes any sense. So say you miss some events or you want to correct some, some things that you cannot capture or change some but business logic, you can always go and refold the data from Hadoop back into Druid. So that's what our stacks our stack look like. I think as I was talking about that, I mentioned most of the or some of the industry uh, movement to our common solutions. Yeah, so um, Airbnb works at a gigantic scale. So, I mean, many of the companies that are using this, you know, the type of big data stack that you outlined, uh, they do work at, at a large scale, but Airbnb is, is, is quite a large scale um, and, and will continue to grow, obviously. What are the challenges that come from working at the scale? I mean, it, does it get to a point where, like, do you get to a point very, very, fairly quickly where it's like, uh, you know, once you get to this, once you get to point X, any point beyond X is is just as easy as it is at X, or it, uh, or does it does it continue to get uh, get harder uh, like in, in linear relation to to your growth? Does that does that question make sense? Yeah, it, it does really make sense. It's funny that you talk about like the big scale of Airbnb because I'm I'm coming out of Facebook and Yahoo, so. Um, you know, for me, it feels like this is very small data and, like, <laughs> you know, there's plenty of mappers and reducers and you're like, you know, this, the scale seems like, oh, we can scan through most of our data set and we can join, you know, uh, we can hash map most of our dimension data. Um, so coming from Facebook, it really feels like, uh, like a drop, not a drop in the bucket, but, um, but then compared to a lot of say the startups who use, um, airflow, Airbnb is, is a fairly large scale, so we have a, a, a really good data infrastructure team that uh, manages our Hadoop cluster, Spark cluster, um, you know, everything data related. So Druid, so we have uh, more than a dozen people now, you know, keeping that working at scale. And that's really important. That's very foundational to, um, to you know, what a data engineer can do or what a data scientists can do. If you don't have this foundation, it becomes really hard. Um, I think as to how it evolves over time, it, it feels linear. It seems like you always solve the next problem and you always work on what's most important to you. And, you know, the, so I'm trying to think whether there are kind of step changes or plateau where you're just like, Here's something really big, big we need to solve, you know, in order for us to move forward. Hmm. But the, the first thing is, like, I think one, one key element of, say, if we look at the maturity life cycle of an organization in relation to data. Um, so there, there's a point where that's really important is to get a decent data warehouse, right? And to start thinking about metrics and dimensions. And, and that hasn't changed since the old days of business intelligence. So to have mm. clarity to what are we measuring, how do we think about our business, um, do we have all the data that we need? You know, are we accumulating this data? Is it okay? Can we, you know, make decision based on this data? So that's very foundational. Mm. That's the first problem to solve. I would say, um, you don't depending on the nature of your business. Uh, if you do thirty day, ninety day analytics, and you're looking at engagement and growth. You don't necessarily need streaming or you don't need all these fancy things. You just need uh, a good source of data, good metrics, good dimension um, and trust, you know, internal trust mm -hmm. and that culture of being data driven and trusting the data. OK, fascinating. So let's talk more about that culture and the and the implementation level details of getting a good data culture. Um, you know, as a data engineer, you're building 
infrastructure for software engineers and data scientists. How do you gather requirements and communicate with those other engineers? You know, as you as you're building products that are essentially for internal customers, how do you think about that? So how to gather requirements around around data and work with other departments. I, I think it's like it's, it's, it's a long process and you know the company needs to be ready and you need to work with people that are data un, hung, hungry for data um, and, and you know provide the data that they need and it's a, it's a slow process. I think to you know to go from a company that is kind of gut driven to a company that's fully data driven. Um, I, th- I think it's a slow process of like earning trust and and you know having there's all sorts of people in a business every day that have all sorts of arguments about how things should go, and in the end, you know, data always wins. But you need to have data you can trust in place in order to even have uh, an argument that goes beyond. Um, gut or, or things like that. So one thing that really helped um, companies like Facebook and Airbnb making decision is having a solid A-B, A-B testing framework, for instance. Right. So if you have A-B testing, you know exactly, you know, using stats and using experimentation, you can make your point for sure that um, a red button is or a green button is better than a, than a red button by 12.2 percent or, you know, with exactitude. And that's important. Fascinating. Okay, so since we're talking about data engineering, we should talk about Airflow, which is an open source platform developed by Airbnb to programmatically create, schedule, and monitor workflows. So to start off, what is a workflow, and why is it relevant to the topic of data engineering? Right, so let's picture um, an organization where you have five people um, working with data, or let's say, let's say a dozen people working with data. And in this group of people, um, there's people that need to organize all this data and structure it and process it um, to, you know, maybe for data warehousing purposes, just to organize this data as an asset for the company, or, you know, to, to power internal systems or uh, internal workflows or you know, uh, sometimes product-facing type of uh, data processing. So there will be people working with data that need to author batch jobs. And let's say if these 12 people, um, in average, generate you know, two um, data processing jobs per week, it won't take very long before you have a large number of data processing jobs. And very often, these data processing jobs, they need to work in a very specific order. So that means... Um, I cannot process the data until it's here. And maybe someone else wants to use the data I generated to generate another data set. So that, that, that tends to generate very complex graph of dependencies across these individual processes. And Airflow is a system that allows you to define that programmatically because um, the nature of these workflow is complex. It's changed it quickly. And now you think of if you start thinking of bigger organization uh, like like Google or large companies that are data driven, then you have hundreds of people working with data, authoring jobs every day, and this graph of dependency is in motion and becomes like a symphony that needs to occur every hour, every day. And you need like some sort of an orchestra director to to make sure that everyone or every job, everyone plays their part at the right time for the right moment, the right level of intensity. And that's very complex. So that is uh, the problem that Airflow is trying to address is to allow for people to author these jobs and to understand what's actually happening while, you know, the symphony is taking place every day. To summarize what you just said, there, there was a talk that you gave and you said that Airflow wanted to address the problem where companies grow to have this complex network of processes and they have intricate dependencies. This is what you you were focusing on, the dependencies. And you also said that analytics and batch processing are mission critical and that tons of time is spent writing jobs, monitoring, and troubleshooting issues. Can you explain how this set of problems impacts the end user at Airbnb and how Airflow improves the state of affairs right so it comes down so i was talking about data uh, trust earlier right so for 
So I think we, we all agree that companies, uh, you know, in this millennium need to be data driven, right? Data is extremely important. And for companies to be data driven, uh, we need to have trust in the data that we have. And to have trust in the data that we have, we need to make sure that all the data is processed in the right way and that we have um, we have clarity as to what is what is running when it ran, um, that there's data, data quality checks that are in place, you know, the same way that maybe in software engineering you'll have unit tests and data engineering sometimes you'll have uh, data quality checks, you know, uh, as a milestone or a gateway where we don't publish data if we know it, it doesn't, it, if we see that it smells funny, for instance. Um, so, um, so the role that Air, Airflow is a productivity tool for data engineers or people working with data to allow them to stay sane and deliver um, a good product every day. So deliver reliable data every day. The same way that, um, you know, for a cook, a kitchen that is clean with a state-of-the-art appliances, with all the room that they need to work, uh, with the, the right tools provided, is extremely important to cook healthy meals uh, in time. Um, so it's very similar for data engineering. We need a set of tools that, uh, where we can have clarity as to what's going on and, um, uh, and, and just like being able to, um, to, to, uh, to, to produce, uh, to send a product that we know is safe and reliable and, you know, being able to keep on, um, doing the work of a data engineer without having to say, uh, fight fires every day or, you know, that kind of stuff. Your company has important projects that need to get done. The iOS app needs to be rewritten for Android. The database needs to be migrated. Your continuous deployment system needs to be built. The website needs a complete redesign. But you don't have enough software engineers and designers to get all this work done. TopTal is here to save you. TopTal gives you exclusive access to the top 3% of freelance talent. Software engineers and designers, from Python to PHP. TopTal has the freelance talent you need to get your projects finished on time with top quality. In the past, we had to worry about flaky freelancers with poor communication skills unreliable internet connections, subpar technical skills, and so on. TopTal screens for these kinds of things and only works with seasoned professionals with tremendous problem-solving skills, personality, and drive. Here's how it works. TopTal's internal team of senior engineers will work with you to understand your project scope and your talent needs, and they will custom match you with just a few hand-picked candidates this means that whenever you need to add top-shelf talent for a critical project, you can be connected with pre-screened engineers who are hand-picked for your needs. And the results are impressive. TopTal clients conduct just 1.7 interviews for every hire that they make. All you need is to come ready with some decent technical specifications of your project, and TopTal's team of engineers will take care of you from there. If you are looking to add critical talent fast and you need a source you can trust, go to toptal.com slash SE daily. You can also send me an email directly at softwareengineeringdaily at gmail.com and I will personally introduce you to the team at TopTal so that you can learn more. We live in unique times. The nature of work is changing and more and more industry leading companies from Airbnb to JP Morgan are realizing the benefits of scaling quickly and staying flexible by working with elite freelancers. So if you're short on resources for your projects, check out toptal.com slash SE daily. Thanks to TopTal for sponsoring the show. Now let's get on with this episode. So uh, there have been other dependency management, workflow management frameworks such as Spotify's Luigi what what does it take to to build a workflow engine and and uh, how does how does airflow compare to other ones that have come before it right so I've used uh, along the years I've used many different solutions um, so I can talk 
specifically about about Luigi, or maybe I'll start by answering the question of what does it take to build a workflow engine. So, uh, luckily, workflow management, it, like contrarily to some di- the real data computation, data processing, um, is not as computation intensive. So, using Python for the purpose of gluing uh, gluing jobs together works works fairly well. Um, what does it take? So, it takes um, I would say like the common skills that you need to build software, right? And then, it, and then, as in, um, as in any, as in anything, I think for the builder to be intimately uh, to know the problem that he's trying to solve very well is very important. So, having worked as a data engineer for like fifteen years now in many different companies uh, of different skills and having used similar packages, I think that all helps in building a great product. That's like kind of cutting edge of what data engineers want today to get the work done. Um, now as to the differences with other systems. So um, when I first joined Airbnb, they were very aware that they needed something better. So we were investing in data engineering. We knew um, that we needed a, a data warehouse. We needed you know, to have a data engineering department so we could solve the problems uh, that we had at the time. I could get into more detail as to what it looked like at that point in time. Uh, but we looked at, at that point in time, I connected with people in the data infrastructure team here, and we looked at the different options that we had in the open source uh, world. So we wanted to go open source because the rest of our stack is open source. And you know, for all the common benefits uh, of open source, being able to contribute, being able to fix our own problems, uh, making sure it connects with our infrastructure well. So with open source, it's nice because if there's no socket or plugs, you can just write one and make it work for you. So that was really important to us. So at that point in time, we did look at uh, Uzi Azkaban and uh, Luigi. Um, and Luigi shares a lot of uh, of design um there's, there's, there's a lot of common between Airflow and Luigi, and I can expand on the on the differences in just a moment. But we ruled out Uzi and Azkaban because we had people coming from the companies where these tools have been built and are mostly used. And we were told, please, whatever you do, do not choose this tool. So these tools had like not great reputation for people that were, like the more intimate people were with these tools, the more they would recommend us to not <laughs> use them. And I think I think it's unfair to, to say that. I might not be fair to say that anymore because these tools are evolving. I'm not sure if Azkaban is evolving. I'm not. Sure. I don't keep track of these projects very well. But they might have changed, right? Reputation uh, follows you for a long time. So well, it's so hard to get these things right on the first try. Right, right. It is, and I think like you know, Airflow is built partly on top of the knowledge that was accumulated while building these other things. So there's these you know life cycles too in open source where something newer and shinier and, and better comes through and one day, you know, Airflow will be the antiquated solution, but to, today it might be a newer generation thing. So uh, you gotta enjoy it while it's the golden age of Airflow. <laughs> um, so as, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead like talking about Luigi a little bit. So when I yeah, look please. more specifically into Luigi, so Luigi um, is a workflow manager, but it's also a data uh, processing platform. So. Um, so it is designed to stream data and compute data in Python, which is something um, I kind of fundamentally kind of disagree with. Or I think I think we don't want to allow people to process data in Python because as you scale up, it becomes quite expensive. It, like, Python is probably not the proper language and the, the proper uh, set of tools to process large amount of data. Right? You probably want to do that in more uh, strictly type language, uh, you know, something like Java or C++ or do use a database engine or, you know, to, for that purpose. That's probably debatable too, but uh, that was one thing. And then one thing that was really important to me was to be able to dynamically generate tasks, right? So if you write a workflow engine um, or if you write a workflow, in some cases you're like, okay, I've got task A, I've got task B, task C, I'm going to chain them up and here's my workflow. But in many cases, when you look at the, the more bleeding edge uh, things that Facebook is doing, uh, that now Airbnb is doing, is, is to be able to do things around uh, analysis automation and just computation framework, to be able to dynamically 
generate tasks. So if we, uh, if I bring back the example of the A/B testing framework, um, you know, Airbnb runs hundreds of experiments uh, at, at any point in time, and to, to enhance the, the the user experience. So we run tons of experiment, and each one of these experiments uh, has a part to play in the data pipeline. And uh, with with Airflow, we're able to generate uh, data pipelines dynamically based on configuration files. Um, so that allows us to be more dynamic, to have smaller unit of work, um, and to do much more complex things. So if we look at mm. uh, to, to instantiate a task in Airflow, uh, we just instantiate an object. So we instantiate an operator. So say a, a hive job, I, I might say, um, I can write a for loop that will instantiate 100 hive jobs based on 100 files that might be in the local folder. On the Luigi side, you have to derive a task in order to create a new task. So that means it's, you have to get into metaprogramming if you want to create tasks dynamically. So that was mm. a fundamental concept for me to be able to generate tasks dynamically. I wanted a DSL or a language or an API that would allow people to very naturally um, create workflows kind of programmatically or based on configurations. Mm. Fascinating. Um, so, you know, one of the things you mentioned, you said uh, you were you said you could touch on the state of affairs when when Airbnb when you first got to Airbnb. Can can you describe that in more detail? Right. And um, so, as I joined Airbnb, so that was a, a little bit more than a year ago. Um, there was a lot of data scientists and no, uh, not many data engineers. So I think they had three data engineers at the time, two that had just joined. And one, um, so Aaron Keyes, who work at Airbnb, was kind of the first uh, data engineer at Airbnb. And he started building a warehouse. They started doing the things that data scientists would do every day, uh, but then creating a foundation for data. So he started building a warehouse and everybody rallied behind that, seeing the value of not doing the same computation over and over. So in two more... So, so, so let's say before, so before um, Aaron started building this warehouse, people would always access raw data and transform it in different ways. So you, you had to work with very raw ingredients uh, that were sometimes dirty, sometimes you know uh, missing, and somehow out of that recreate some version of the truth. And then the different data scientists could not necessarily agree on the business rules or on those transformation and these transformation would be redone at every analysis, meaning that every metric or every dimension definition could change in time. So then it, you're, if you don't have a warehouse and you don't have that, that first set of data transformation to clean it up and apply a set of business rule uh, and fill in the holes mm -hmm. that you have, then everyone needs to redo that work every day. That's one thing, it's oh. wasted effort. And then you have the other problem of all metrics are different and, ch and changing depending on who did the analysis in time. Then wow. it's really hard to build trust in data. So there's both, yeah, there's both like wasting effort and losing trust, which are really bad things if you're trying to get your company to be more data driven. So yeah. So then we started, uh, you know, and I think people rallied the data scientists. Maybe I don't know, like a dozen or two at the time. Um, started really rallying behind that and ident identifying the need. For, like, we need more people like him. What's what's? I, I'm not even sure if they had a title for that role yet. I think they called it uh, an ETL engineer. So uh, ETL standing for Extraction, Transform, and Load as a common, uh, you know, acronym to uh, the process behind data engineering. So, uh, so I got hired soon after that, and now we're about a dozen data engineers uh, in the team. Hmm. So you're explaining the the problem set and and, it's, and like this idea of repeated work and uh, lack of communication, some some reduced uh, trust, um, and you know re people doing redundant work. Um, my understanding is that this this communication and this. Uh, level of trust was also improved by another tool that uh, was developed at Airbnb called Panoramics. Um, Panoramics is a data slicing and visualization tool. 
Could you tell me about the set of use cases that you wanted to serve with Panoramics? Right. So, so Panoramics, to give a, a little bit more context, so is a, yeah, it's a, data, as you said, a data exploration, visualization, dashboarding platform that's also open source, also written in Python, that's not necessarily officially uh, under the Airbnb umbrella just yet and not officially released as we haven't really written an a engineering blog post, but we'll soon do. Um, I'll be talking about it at Strata in Santa Clara. I believe it's in uh, March 2016, so this upcoming March. Um, and this, this tool uh, started as a hackathon project in July, so it's fairly new too. Um, and this tool really aims at uh, making it extremely easy and low friction for people internally to, uh, to visualize, analyze data, share insight. Um, and I think, you know, so there, there are tons of business intelligence tools out there. Uh, probably people use a uh, Chartio and there's like so many vendors of these, um, data visualization tools where you can build charts and dashboards. So, um, Panoramics is, uh, another one of these tools, but it is, um, it is open source. I don't think there's a lot of open source tools in that space. And for us, the problem that it solves is just making data extremely fluid internally, where, where we don't need to write SQL. You don't need to, uh, to, to know R or to know Python. You can just, you can just go to this website, uh, point to a data set and start building visualizations very quickly. So, and before Panoramics, what were the tools that employees were using for data slicing and visualization? Right, and, and they're still using it. So it's complementary to a, a bigger, um, the, the notion of sharing and consuming uh, information or data internally is still uh, at Airbnb solved with many tools. And Panoramics were actually internally kind of rolling out, doing a big push now to give access to everyone internally and, and get value out of it. Um, but the other tools that are complementary to that um, are Tableau. So Tableau is popular uh, internally. We use that extensively. Um, we also use, um, so AirPal is another, another open source project out of Airbnb um, that um, essentially the, the role of AirPal is a SQL. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a website where you can write SQL against our inter internal Presto and retrieve CSV files that you can then, you know, visualize in Excel or you can, you know, you can use in your favorite programming or scripting language to, uh, to visualize. So AirPal is, is the, the bar there is you need to know SQL and you need to have access to the warehouse and then you can, you know, make your own extract and visualize it your own way. Um, Tableau, um, the barrier there is like you need a little bit of training and, and we need to pay, to, to, you need to get a license for you to use uh, this tool internally. It is not very cheap and sometimes it's a little hard because you need to create extract. So you need to get somehow a pipeline that would load data into Tableau every day. Um, so, and that can be a little tricky. So Panoramics comes in the middle of, of that and other tools, right? Because we also have R and I write the notebook and all sorts of other ways to visualize data or consume data internally, which assumes that you know a programming language. So there's all the people at Airbnb that we want to reach to that are not necessarily SQL savvy or programmers, uh, but they want to see data. They want to slice and dice. They want to group by this. They want to see these metrics. They want to filter. Um, so that's the use case that Panoramics is solving with a very low friction, super easy to use UI. So tell me if I understand the story correctly. Uh, you can tell me where this is incorrect. So it sounds like at the time at which you got to Airbnb, it was in this situation where the uh, the way that people were pulling data and uh, doing ad hoc analysis on it was totally non-standardized. Um, and the way that they were cleaning the data was non-standardized. So you had all these inconsistencies. And so the first thing that you did as an organization was move to a place where you sort of had, you've got airflow and it's, and it helps to standardize the cleaning process and then, and, and the data availability process. And then once that's standardized, you still have people that are pulling the data off and doing ad hoc analysis in their own disjoint ways. Um, and then what Panoramics does is it standardizes that process and it gives people an agreed upon 
format and platform to to negotiate the, the the data analysis side of things. It gives the data scientists a standardized world to live in. It, would you say that's accurate? That is that completely accurate. I, I think like one thing, one change uh, that that also like Panoramics provides is uh, democratization of of access to data internally, where maybe historically you needed to have. If you had a data-related question, you would have to go through a data professional, so most likely a, a data scientist, and say, I've got this this question, I've got this gut feeling, I'm curious, like I would like to have more information about a specific type of action on the site or, or something of that nature. And you could not answer the question yourself because um, maybe you didn't know SQL, maybe you didn't know where the tables were, maybe you didn't know how to transform the data. So now we have a data warehouse that um, that has clean, intelligible data that's well organized, that's well documented. So that's one of the assets that allows for democrat- the, the democratizing the access to data, and then just making it extremely easy for anyone to go point to one of these data sets and and ask their own questions. Mm-hmm. And that's more on the consumption side, and that's uh, partly panoramics. You know, say Tableau allows people to do that, but it's a little bit higher friction. Mm. Uh, Panoramics also allows for for data scientists and anyone really to be a content creator and create um, what we call slices, which are individual charts or dashboards. And from these uh, these charts or dashboard, you can go deeper and continue your analysis. As you share a Panoramics dashboard or you share a Panoramics um, chart, or what we call a slice, then it's just, it can be just a starting point for a deeper analysis. Right? Mm. So I can send you a slice that represents the number of booking in Paris uh, during um, the, the saddening ev- like recent events. And you could take this, this, this slice and look at it and be like, oh, that's interesting. Let me zoom in on this time frame and let me group by uh, where people were coming from and how say, different metrics got affected by, by these recent events, right? So everything becomes the starting point of a, a potentially a, a deeper analysis. Mm. Fascinating. So uh, to, to, to put another level of technical depth on this, uh, Panoramics has deep integration with Druid, and you've already talked about some of the importance of Druid to the data stack at Airbnb why why is druid so useful from the from the point of view of of panoramics right so the so the project actually started so to roll, to go back into uh, the genesis of how panoramics started so we had um, an intern i think around june that was doing some tests with druid and the data in druid was just really hard to consume you have to uh, write a query and a, as a json blob and then you receive a json blob and Somehow we have to figure out a way to visualize this. So I thought for Hackathon, I would just build a small UI that would allow us to, you know, to say, view a line chart and, and a few fields. We would say, group by this, show me these metrics off of this data set. And, um, and this was the goal with behind that was opening the doors to real-time uh, analysis, right, internally. Um, so that's how it's, it started. I think... You know, we we all know that that real time is like important, if not critical, to be able to to know exactly what's happening uh, right this minute and being able to ask question about what happened five minutes ago or fifteen minutes ago. For different use cases, right? It might it might target a totally different set of people or set of questions in the company uh, that are complementary with the uh, the questions that the batch processing world will uh, answer. So let's say um, uh, what use cases are better or are typical for for a real time uh, type of data, right? Everything that is ops related, right? Like if you have um, something is happening right now on a set of machines in a specific data center, and you want to know which machines are affected, which countries are affected, uh, all, when when did it start? Was it degradation? Is it coming back right now? Like we just did something. Is it, is the traffic coming back or not? Um, is it coming back across the board? So that's very critical for, say, ops type of question. Um, even for engineering, as we, you know, there's always instrumentation. All this data that we collect and analyze is instrumented. And it can be 
super useful for uh, engineers as they instrument the data and put new events to see exactly how it's flowing and how and whether they're actually seeing what they expect to see. Um, there's also say, when we launch experiments, we like to see whether enough the, the people that are getting assigned to these experiments and whether it's affecting the metrics in bad way. So someone could uh, produce an experiment that is really bad and you know leading to people uh, being unable to use the site, and we want to know quickly so we can you know turn shut down this experiment. So there's tons of use cases, and they're they're very different they're, and complementary to. Uh, to the other questions that uh, the batch pressing world will answer, like how is our site growing? Like look, doing like growth analytics and engagement analytics. So that stuff is like 30 day, 90 day, you know, year over year. Um, and that we can do very well with, with the uh, pressing world, the batch pressing world. So uh, what Panoramics does, so I started with uh, this real time solution. I was like, wow, this website is getting really good and useful. And why not, you know, making it so that we can also query the data in, in the warehouse. That seemed like a very easy next step. And as I did that, you know, I wanted to connect it to Presto, which is the, the mean by which we access the data in the warehouse um, interactively at Airbnb. So I decided to, uh, to do it using the SQL Alchemy ORM uh, expression language, which is um, a, a library in Python that allows you to write SQL that can be translated to any SQL dialect of any database. Um, so that allowed us to expand the scope of panoramics and expose a cohesive way to query real-time data as well as uh, data coming from any other data sources, right? So we can query MySQL databases, Presto, and people in the community are already, uh, so there's a little bit of community around panoramics since it's not officially released, but people are querying Redshift and uh, people have used Impala and other, uh, they connected panoramics to whatever database they have running, and it also works very well. So we can have a cohesive vision. We can have dashboard that will show you some elements of real time and some along with elements of uh, from the batch processing world. Mm. We don't need to train people on a set of tools for uh, for batch processing or for cert like if you need access. If your question is this, then you use this tool. If your question is that, you use a different tool. At least there's it's a little bit more cohesive there. Mm. So. To begin to close off, I'd like to zoom out and talk some about the macro perspective. You've been doing data engineering for about a decade. Given the trajectory of where you see things going, what you've already seen, what's the future in this space? Well, that's a, that's a good question. It's always super hard to see the future. Um, I think for the rest of the world to follow Silicon Valley is always like a safe bet, right? So we can see what's happening in Silicon Valley. So what's happening in places uh, like like Airbnb and all the little startups and the, the not so not so small startups and, and you know, seeing that everyone is becoming more data driven. There's a focus on analytics and all the skills around data are extremely valued, right? I, I read an article, I think it was yesterday that Classdoor said that one of the best jobs in America this year is to be a data scientist. Um, I think also I've seen that uh, Airbnb was like rated the number one, one place to work. So if you're a data scientist at Airbnb, you're in a pretty good place. But I think that the skills around data are extremely valued. It will keep going that way for companies to be data-driven, data-informed, reactive, and to um, and to uh, for people in meetings to um, argue using data, you know, I think that will expand if it's not already the case to the whole business world and beyond, right? Even mm. academics are also more data driven. So, so data, so more data, bigger data, more data solution, distributed systems, um, the cloud, of course, you know, uh, but so all of this is happening. We already see it happening. There's, a lot of divergence in the stack, right? I don't know if you, you, you noticed that too, but... Oh, yeah. That there, was my next question. Right. So the divergence in... So I'm, I'm seeing there should be some convergence at some point. Uh, but I think in some cases, we'll see ubiquitous open source solution take over um, some of the vendors out there, right? So I'm hoping that as an open source developer that 
um, that the world becomes more open in terms of the mm -hmm. software becoming free and the software being like a collaboration effort as opposed to, you know, built by companies. So who's, so <laughs> out of this divergence and stacking and tools, if there is convergent, where is it a uh, convergence later? Where is it going to converge towards? And I think it will converge mm -hmm. towards, um, a set of really good libraries that people can use to build uh, tools and, mm. to, to, and to write software. I was having a conversation uh, recently with someone from Tableau uh, that was saying, you know, Tableau is built by 200 people or by so many engineers, right? I forgot the number. And it's amazing that you were able to build panoramics on your own, which is some, somewhat like a subset of the feature uh, of Tableau. But even if it's if you say it's 50 or it's 20% of the core features of Tableau um, that satisfy maybe 80% of the use cases, but let's say uh, we, we say it is 20% of the features of Tableau, that one person could build that is outstanding. But I was like, wait a minute, it's not just me building this. Uh, I've written very little of the code that is used in Panoramics. If you look at what's behind there, I use all sorts of frameworks and libraries that have been written by probably more people than there are engineers at Tableau, mm -hmm. right? So behind the scene, there's, you know, there's everything that goes into making a browser. There's, you know, everything that goes into JavaScript and different languages and standard libraries and those languages. Plus, you know, say the web framework that I use and, you know, so I use Flask, I use Flask App Builder. There's a huge list of dependencies that have been built by a lot of people. So for software to become more open source or for people to go more towards these solutions seem, seems like uh, where the future might be going or certainly where I hope uh, it is going towards. So, I mean, when you talk about convergence in the terms of libraries, uh, you know, are you talking about at the level of... So, like, one, one example I see of convergence in this the big data stack is Kafka. That's, like... Yeah. Maybe the on, the only the only right. example of convergence, like you know, people have kind of decided, like, yeah, you use Kafka, you you, you know, you probably use Kafka over uh, RabbitMQ or ZeroMQ, uh, and maybe there's some convergence in the space of Spark, but we can't even figure out where Spark over like the Spark overlap need to overlap with. Or does it overlap with Flink, or does, is it is it mutually exclusive with Storm? Uh, like these are things that I have trouble. Uh, recognizing, I guess. So, are you saying that this is the level where where you think things will converge or sort out in the future, or are you thinking there's like a higher level that uh, stuff gets built on top of? Yeah, uh, that's a very tough question. And it, again, it's hard to see the future, but there are other areas of convergence. I think like HDFS is there for to survive, for instance, mm -hmm. right? So, in a distributed file system. So maybe if you look at the unit of uh, it depends what unit you look at. If you look at uh, vendor packages that are many, many things, um, it's it's not an area of convergence. A business intelligence is is uh, complex and made out of a lot of components. But if you look at the individual components, so say a distributed file system or a messaging bus, uh, you know, so there might be convergence at that level. Uh, that is pretty clear. So I think we're seeing, yeah, Kafka, of course, is like the big winner there. Spark and so say in stream processing, I'm not sure. So that's one that's still up for. So there's Storm, Spark Streaming, Sansa. Um, there, there, I, I think that's a unit. So say stream processing, well, there will be eventually clear convergence. Uh, compute, like general data computation might be like a kind of too generic, but it seems like Spark is, is where it's going. Um, so, so then if you look at a, you know, something like Hadoop, what is Hadoop? Well, Hadoop is the sum of its parts and it's actually the definition of what is Hadoop is changing. At some point they might say like, oh, Hadoop is not MapReduce, Hadoop is Spark now or, right? So the collection of things might change, but the building blocks, I think it makes sense for these building blocks to converge. And again, there's always yeah. a life cycle in software, right? Where as say HDFS might reach one day um, the down cycle of, of its uh, of its lifetime, then there might be a divergence again until people uh, rally around mm. a new distributed file system. So it's hard to tell, but it's 
it's it's been uh, interesting to go to conferences say like strata and seeing so many boots of people doing essentially the same thing and try to reinvent old things uh, you know like databases like it was something new that all of a sudden everyone wanted to make a, a database again <laughs> That seems like a great place to stop. Um, Max, thanks so much for taking time out of your day to come on to Software Engineering Daily. Um, I'm a huge fan of Airbnb, a uh, huge fan of your open source work. So uh, thanks for coming on the show and I'll, I'll keep up with you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you.